And I'll just pin the speaker as well. Okay. So welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today for a very special webinar that we have. It's actually our third birthday today. So three years of the Ask and Tell with MSL's webinar. Um, so it's great to see you all join us today. And we have an absolutely stellar lineup of panelists with Aoife Dwyer, Marie X. Junkman and uh, Helen Kane. And then also just some other exciting announcements that we have today is that me and Sonia have been hosting the webinar with the last year, but we're going to be handing it over to uh, two new co-hosts that are going to be taking over for the next year. So we have Jen and also Melody. So I'm just going to hand it over to them uh, to give a brief introduction uh, for themselves and introduce themselves to the audience. So over to you and go with Jen first. Great. Thanks, Gavin and Sonia, for this past year, and thank you for the opportunity to start co-hosting. My name is Jan. I'm currently based in Houston, Texas, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Harry Quintana Hormuti. Um, I'm currently studying um, pulmonary hypertension and associated right ventricular failure, and I'm very interested in the MSL career path and actively looking for ways to, you know, be an MSL. And I can't wait to um, share some very, very great con uh, con content um, with this community and help us all succeed in our aspirations and our goals. Over to you, Melody. Okay, thanks, thank Jan. Um, and thank you again for all like Gavin and Sonia like for hosting like awesome web webinar for the past year and my name is Melody I'm a third year um, PhD student at University of Nebraska Medical Center and I'm currently working on a drug called midazolam which is a sedative and I just want to look how they affect like non from neonatal until like uh, adulthood and I use like rat model and same to Jan like similar to Jan and probably everybody here that I am also an aspiring MSL that love to you know want to like explore more in the career path so like that's why I'm signing up for like being co-host and hopefully me and Jen will help uh, like create a another like good year of the webinar series okay thank you Jen thank you Melody for that brief background and then so also another uh, exciting thing, we've had just past 1,000 followers on our Ask and Tell with MSL LinkedIn page. So the community is growing and it's great to see so many people here today. Uh, for the title of the webinar today is The Evolving Role of the MSL and How to Excel as an MSL. And we've an absolute stellar lineup of panelists, as I mentioned. So I'm just going to hand it over to them to give some brief introductions uh, of themselves. So I'm going to go just in alphabetical order. So I'll ask Aoife to just introduce herself first, give a little bit about her background and background in a, as a medical science liaison and in medical affairs. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Gavin, and thanks so much um, for the invite today. Always love speaking about the MSL role and delighted to be on a panel with Helen and Marika as well. Uh, so my name is Aoife. I'm Irish originally. Um, I did my PhD in Ireland, so I did a degree in genetics and then a PhD in immunology. And I knew the bench was not for me, so I really wanted to get out of academia as soon as possible. I did try and quit my PhD at one stage. Some people say that it's not a PhD unless you try and quit at least once, and I would agree with that. Um, so I moved to Australia where I got my first MSL role working with GSK as a vaccine MSL. I then worked for smaller companies. I worked um, on a pain product, which was fascinating because the KOLs I interacted with there ranged from anaesthetists to oncologists to addiction specialists. And I also worked as a senior MSL for a different company uh, launching an obesity drug. When I gained more experience as an MSL, I had the opportunity to mentor more junior people and I really enjoyed it. And I also found that the questions they were asking me were the exact same questions that I had. How do you reach out to KOLs? When you get a KOL meeting, what do you actually say to them? What is an insight and how can I share them? All these really, really practical and very important things. 
So for that reason, I founded my company, MSL Consultant, about five years ago now. I'm also the host of the MSL Consultant podcast, where I interview medical affairs leaders to learn more about the evolving role of the MSL. I do a lot of one-on-one coaching. I sell online courses for aspiring MSLs and also to more experienced MSLs. And recently, I also had the absolute pleasure of working for um, a tech company that develops products for medical affairs. So we had the opportunity to work with MSLs right up to VP of Medical Affairs, utilizing software to um, execute more strongly on their KOL engagement. We're really happy to be here today and thank you for the invite. Okay, and next up then over to you, Helen. Uh, Thanks, Gavin. And um, hello, everyone. It's really great to meet you and to echo Aoife's comments. It's fabulous to be part of this panel. So uh, it's hard to follow Aoife, really. That was that was incredibly impressive. But anyway, I'm I'm Helen Kane. I'm a pharmacist by background and I I joined the industry. I'm not I'm not willing to share when, but suffice it to say, I had a 25 year career in in medical affairs um, in in a wide range of roles. And I was one of the early MSLs um, back in the time uh, in in my days at Roche, really when the MSL role was relatively new. So the US is is a little bit ahead of of the rest of Europe in terms of this role and its history. And I I worked as an MSL and I subsequently became an MSL leader and MSL excellence lead and was one of the founding members of the first professional association for MSLs in the UK and Ireland, the MSLA. And was very privileged to serve as chair of that association for three years. And that really awoke in me um, uh, a a desire to make a difference. I could see that many organisations were were really facing a number of challenges about this role. And um, I just felt that I wanted to bring the passion that I had for the role of the MSL and indeed for the wider medical affairs function Um, out of working within one organization to the wider industry. So um, I, back in 2016, I left corporate life and set up on my own as as a consultant. Um, And today I'm really proud to say that we're a global specialist medical affairs training consultancy. So we have the privilege of working with MSLs throughout the world. And um, we, we work with startup biotechs, we work with established pharma and really our core focus is around um, all things strategic relating to the role of the MSL but in particular we focus on really driving excellence in terms of capabilities so thinking about the skills that the MSL of today needs to have and indeed the MSL leader and beyond to be successful so um I'm sorry, that probably took a little bit longer than you expected, but um, that's me. Well, I'll be really quick then. That's uh, <laughs> I'm very, very honored. Uh, and now everybody knows why I'm so honored to, to be here. You know, I, I consider Helen to be uh, one of my uh, mentors. I mean, through we've known each other for several years now. And um, every time I interact with Helen, she adds so much to you know I learned so much from her continuously so I always recommend you know working uh, uh, with her um and I've never Evie and I have never met but I've always heard wonderful things about uh, you so I'm very honored to be with you uh, as well uh, so I've I'll keep it really short I've been in industry for um over 20 years I moved into executive coaching and now we're really working on um you know capabilities on a um you know, leadership development uh, plan together with the Department of Labor here in the United States, uh, um, you know, with the seven tiers of, of what you need to be successful within your particular uh, job. And we're working on that with uh, our mobile app, which we hopefully launch sometime soon. Helen already had a little sneak peek and, and you know, hopefully we get to work together. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to leave me behind. Uh, um, so I'm very excited to be here and look forward to all the questions. Oh yeah, and I I'm, I work at Harvard too as a fellow. Uh, um, I look at the neuroscience of uh, executive coaching through the lens of emotional intelligence. That's me, briefly. 
Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And clearly, as you can see, all our panelists today have a wealth of knowledge and experience as an MSL and in medical affairs. Um, so just to just kind of start us off, we always have a mixture, quite a few aspiring MSLs, and then we have a mixture today of aspiring MSLs and current MSLs. So I was just going to ask uh, briefly for some of the aspiring MSLs in the audience for uh, some some just information um, that you could provide to them about getting into their first MSL role. And just just we've we've covered this topic like a few times before, just in full in full linked uh, webinars. So if we can just uh, maybe get keep a bit of brief, maybe starting in reverse order this time with uh, Mariek and then going Marika and going back. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right <laughs> this time anyway. That's that. Um, I always say I've heard it mispronounced so many times. I'm not sure I'm saying it right anymore. Uh, but for aspiring MSLs, I think networking is very important. Um, you always want to make sure that you have a mentor, somebody who champions uh, for you. Like, you know, I've always attached myself a little bit to Helen. Uh, but I really, uh, I think that's one of the most important uh, things. Network, network, and maybe network a little bit more. So I'll follow, Gavin. I think that's what you'd like us to do. So I would like you all to ask yourself a question. And I want, to ask you, I want you to ask yourselves the question, why? Why do I want to be an MSL? And what, is, what are my drivers? So, so uh, what do I know about the role of the MSL? So I appreciate that's more than one question. Because unless you can really answer the first question why with confidence you will come unstuck because believe you me this is such as you know this is such a competitive space today so think about that question ask yourself what is my purpose what is my reason why and check your response with someone else whether it's as, as Maria Kay is saying is you know you have a mentor or you have a buddy or you have someone that you trust run the answer past them and see will this pass muster Will this really get me to that next stage? And if I can add to that, um, I would say two main things to follow up on what Marika said. Networking is so important. Um, utilize LinkedIn, connect with people on LinkedIn, send them messages, see if you can understand more about the role. It's a little bit like online dating. Not everyone is going to reply, but that's OK. Keep reaching out, be polite, write tailored emails, but also and this goes back to Helen's point, really understand the role. There's so much great free information out there now, but it's not enough to passively consume it. You need to be a lot more active. So for example, if you listen to a podcast, if you read a blog post, if you read a white paper on the MSL role and it's posted on LinkedIn, comment underneath that. Utilize LinkedIn to learn a bit more and also grow your personal brand. Don't just say, hey, this was interesting. Say, well, I found this really interesting. I loved, Aoife, how you interviewed this person and they shared this specific thing about the MS role. Be really, really specific about your learning and active in your learning and your networking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, some great advice and tips there. And just for everyone in the audience, Helen actually has uh, her own podcast and so does Aoife. So two great resources there. And I don't think anyone in the MSL medical affairs space um, doesn't know about kind of Tom Caravella's podcast, which is also an absolute wealth of information for any aspiring and current MSLs also. So that's an another great resource that people can be directed towards. Uh, and then just leading on from that, so getting more into the topic of today's discussion. So I'll start with uh, Helen first this time and then can kind of piggyback off each other. But how have you uh, seen the MSL role evolve over time um, and also medical affairs? Oh, my goodness. You know, can I have the rest of the evening <laughs> to answer this question? I, I, I just think, you know, it, it's, it's quite mind blowing. We, we are in such a fast moving space, really. Um, back in the day you know the role of the MSL was really to be that scientific expert and it was very much perceived as being a support function so we you know the MSL was really kind of there to support almost to support sales um to, to, to be a reactive function 
the expectations of medical affairs and of field medical today have never been greater. And there are a huge number of factors that are really influencing that and driving it. And those, many of those relate to the impact of COVID. Many of them relate to the fact that organizations such as MAPS have sort of developed the strategic statement for the role of medical affairs towards 2030. Um, but we are awash with publications, with uh, congresses, with white papers, that, that there is a, so much data out there. So the role of the MSL today is really not straightforward. And I think, and it comes back to the comment that we made at the beginning about really seeking to, to, to understand your why and understand who is the MSL of today, because that role will, will vary hugely from company to company. And um, it's really important that in particular, if you're thinking about applying for a role that you choose to read the job description. But if you're in a role, really ask yourself, am I clear on, on the expectations of, of this role? Am I really clear about the value that I can add? So it's, uh, it's an amazing space to be in. Want to go next, Evie? Yeah, sure. Um, 100% agree, no longer a support function and a lot more of a strategic pillar. Though I would say that does vary from organization to organization and country to country, but we definitely know where we want to be, and that is to be strategic. And as a result of that, when medical affairs are able to demonstrate more strategic capability, more value to the company, they also get more budget as well, which means they actually have more money to execute on medical initiatives. One of the things that I've seen over the last couple of years is medical affairs and the evolving role of the MSL is there are a lot more tools and technology in place now to support the MSLs. So previously I worked on a tool that um, did KOL mapping and KOL planning in a matter of seconds. And this was information that when I was an MSL, I had to do manually. But now a lot of companies are investing in their medical affairs teams and investing in technologies um, to further enable those MSLs to execute against strategic objectives. So that is another change that we're seeing within the industry. And I, I, I want to add on to, to both of them. So we're more strategic. We have more uh, digital you know, support in, in, in many ways. Um, and so we're somewhat moving away from a lot of the scientific pillar that we were. The scientific pillar obviously is still very important, but we also need to develop additional capabilities. Uh, um, like we, we need to become more digitally uh, savvy. Uh, my teenage daughter, you know, looked at me a couple of weeks ago and when I was having trouble with the website or with something on the computer and she looked at me and she said, oh my God, you don't know how to code. So we're getting with a whole new generation and of, of you know, digitally savvy who has to communicate with an older generation, not that I'm old, but, uh, um, or I don't think I'm old, but we need to communicate and have, uh, have good skills. So besides the obviously still very important scientific skills that we, uh, we have in our critical thinking, we also need to develop our capabilities more towards business acumen, strategic thinking, and digital um, uh, tools. So. Gavin, could I could I just add something that I think is really important at this stage? I'm I'm, I'm sorry to, to 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 be really selfish here, but um, we do an annual survey every year, and and the results of that are available on our one community. And what we're learning is that MSLs of today are engaging earlier and earlier in the drug life cycle. So as medical, we are legitimately able to get engaged where our commercial colleagues cannot. And if we think about medical engaging during the clinical development period, um, we know, for example, today that 8% of MSLs are engaging as early as phase one. So those of you that are sat out there thinking about academia, we have MSLs who are engaging with healthcare professionals at that stage. So if we are engaging years and years in advance of, of a drug receiving or an asset receiving approval, think about the impact that can have for an organization in terms of insights, in terms of relationships, 
in terms of the ability to shape and inform. So we have the evolving MSL role in, in that respect. Um, and, and that is really um, being reflected in, in everything that we've said so far, but it is this earlier life cycle engagement that is, is having quite a profound effect. Okay, yeah, some great insights there. And yeah, more than happy for uh, you to jump in, Helen, or any one of the other panelists at any time when you feel like there's something additional relevant that you can add. And um, so just kind of, you kind of already touched on this, but uh, leading on from that. So just some of the recent or emerging trends that you're seeing, uh, kind of already touched on, but just some more, and also maybe some challenges and also opportunities and that present themselves that maybe aspiring or current MSLs should be aware of. So why, 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 don't, why don't you start, Ethan? Yeah, sounds like a plan, Helen. Um, so in terms of some of the emerging trends, we are now seeing a lot more activity from digital opinion leaders. So previously, MSLs engaged mainly with scientific leaders, a scientific leader being someone who publishes a lot, presents at congresses, writes guidelines involved in clinical trials. And now we're seeing that there is a huge amount of digital opinion leaders who have a lot of influence. And when the scientific landscape changes, it's often digital opinion leaders that are the first to communicate. So a really, really important group of individuals for MSLs um, to engage with. Previously, digital opinion leaders usually just use Twitter, but LinkedIn is actually becoming a real hotspot for digital opinion leaders. I was working with um, someone recently in a top pharma company and they were launching a new drug and before their eyes, they could see a group of six top KOLs commenting publicly on LinkedIn about this particular drug and they were able to get those insights in real time. So that is one trend that we're seeing in the industry and kind of some of the changes in terms of the types of people that MSLs are interacting with. So can I ask you a question, Effie? So beyond, you know, LinkedIn and Twitter, which are, you know, we're clearly seeing and moving, but since we we also have these other, you know, social media tools, which are becoming much more uh, uh, prominent, and I'm thinking, you know, TikTok, uh, I'm on Snapchat, and I am amazed with how much goes on on Snapchat with regards to medical affairs. I mean, I, it, it's beyond me, clearly, because I don't know how to code. Uh, um, but how do you see that evolve? Since since you're more in the in the tech part, how uh, um, how are the different channels? Yeah, so it's really interesting, and some of the things that we noted is that it actually varies depending on the therapeutic area. If you take a therapeutic area like aesthetics, like dermatology your digital opinion leaders will likely be on Instagram, whereas things like oncology, they're more likely to be on Twitter. So it does vary depending on the therapeutic area. And it is very much a changing space. When there were changes to Twitter, which were, I think, maybe a couple of months ago, we did see a bit of movement away from Twitter and onto other platforms, but it wasn't enough. That means that Twitter is no longer viable. It's still something where a lot of people do tweet on. So 100%, there will be new social media sources, and it's something that we need to actively keep an eye on as it changes regularly. And why Snapchat? I don't personally know that much about Snapchat myself, and I haven't interacted or known a lot of digital opinion leaders on it, but potentially it is um, another uh, interesting source. So uh, if, if, if I can give um, something that I think is a, is a trend, and it's actually not that much of a recent trend, but it's a really important trend for anyone that is either currently in role um, and, and wanting to really continue to develop themselves or for those of you that are aspiring it's it's the idea of of being able to confidently flex between face to face and virtual engagement so i we've been i'm i'm in paris today i'm working with a group of 30 30 MSLs and i was having a conversation at lunchtime around how they were engaging with their key key external experts and, and it was really fascinating because historically we believed that um, we had to be engaging face to face. It, it, we weren't able to build a relationship unless we were sat in a room with someone building a relationship face to face. 
the world, as we all know, has changed significantly. And actually, long gone are the days where we, we travel half a day across the country to have a 45 minute meeting with with the physician. It's really not a great use of time or resources. And I mean, financial resources. So, um, of course, what we know is that COVID um, pushed us all into a different space. Virtual engagement is not the same as having a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. It's a very different set of skills and it requires a huge amount of planning on the part of the of the MSL. And, and there is so much that you really need to be considering when you're planning for virtual engagement. And so I, I would really encourage you to think about this. Think about, you know, where are my where are my strengths in, in terms of my engagement? Where are the areas that I feel least comfortable? And and seek ask somebody to watch you, ask somebody to sit alongside you the next time you're having a virtual engagement and to give you some feedback. Um, and in addition, if you are an aspiring MSL, you should probably assume that your first interview might well be virtually. So it's really important that if you're invited to present some data or indeed you're having a conversation in the way that we're having a conversation, that you're demonstrating excellence in virtual engagement because that is your future. And now I want to ask you something, Helen, uh, too. So looking forward, you know, even more uh, again, because what I'm hearing, what's not really, you know, in place just yet. So we have the visual engagements, you know, four or five years ago, a Zoom meeting was just, you know, haha, funny, maybe sometime. Now we're really into it continuously like we mm -hmm. are now. And you need to have the special skills. I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. So now we're also starting to see maybe somewhat slower, uh, going into the metaverse. So I know of companies who are already, you know, uh, creating their medical content in the met metaverse to engage with HCPs there. So eventually, you know, just like we were, you know, not thinking necessarily about Zoom, of how Zoom was going to ev uh, evolve, the metaverse is going to evolve at some point too. How and, and this is, of course, you know, looking forward to a little bit. What are some of the things that you see we would need additionally in those skills? Well, I, I just think that um, it's really, really important to to start with the end in mind and and to, you know, it, it, it's important. Mindset is very important. Where are where are my comfort zones? If we think about the fact that we all have different preferences for the way in which we communicate. So think whether you know about DISC, whether you know about Colors Insights, whatever it is, think about you as an individual and your preferences for communication. Mm -hmm. Those are your preferences, that's your agenda. That is the way in which you wish to communicate. What do I know about the people that I'm seeking to engage with? What mm -hmm. do I understand about them and the way that they, how, what do I need to, how do I need to flex my style? What is, what is their preferred channel for, for engaging? Mm -hmm. So really, you know, a, a lot of what we, we've been talking about today is about what we need and what we, we need to be doing. But actually what we have to do, and I love your question, is we have to ask ourselves, what do I know about the person I'm trying to build that relationship with? What do I know about their preferences and how best I can optim how can I really optimize the, the opportunity that I have to engage with them so that I can be truly impactful? So it's it's really it's really quite complex. It's 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 about science, it's about engagement skills, and, and as we said earlier, it's about business acumen, it's about channels, it's about EQ, you know, it's all of this wrapped into one package. Yeah. And what you're talking about is essentially, you know, emotional intelligence. So you're really talking up my, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, what what I love. But yes, you know, self awareness. That's where it starts. And and but awareness of others is where you actually, you know, go over the bridge and make the communication happen. Completely, and it's so often missed. So brilliant. I know it's your space. So. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but, uh, sorry, Gavin. Uh, don't mean to uh, take over. <laughs> oh no, you're fine. You're, this is the conversation is going great, and you actually you actually asked a very similar, basically the exact same question I was going to ask anyway. So we're perfectly in line. Uh, I think uh, Venetia has a question here. Um, so if he wants to unmute himself, he can go ahead and ask. 
Um, either that or if anyone else has any other questions too, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and we can address them. Hey, yeah, awesome. Thank you for giving me the, the time. Um, I wasn't sure how we were supposed to ask questions. Um, but uh, first of all, thank you guys for being here. I know y'all's schedule is probably like super busy, so I really appreciate y'all's time. Um, I wanted to uh, ask a question regarding like digital opinion leaders because that's the first time I'm really like heard of that. Um, and so in, in terms of like defining who exactly is a digital opinion leader, just so I understand, like are those just scientific leaders who are very active on like social media channels or can they also be like, scientific communication experts at companies, like what kind of roles have those digital opinion leaders kind of like, what kind of roles do they officially have on paper? Um, just so that I can kind of be in touch with who to maybe look out for or connect with um, on LinkedIn and, and all that kind of stuff, I'm curious. So I can um, start with that one then, obviously it would be great to hear from Helen and Marika as well. Um, so for digital opinion leaders, a lot of them are clinicians um, who are posting scientific and sharing their clinical experience. To identify a digital opinion leader, and let's use Twitter as an example, but this can also be used for LinkedIn, there's a couple of things you need to look at. So number one, the number of followers they have, and number two, and this is the most important, the engagement they get, okay? So let's say Helen is a digital opinion leader, and I know she's a digital opinion leader because number one, she has a lot of followers, she posts regularly, but number two, people interact with her posts. They comment underneath, they like it, or they reshare it to their network. And that is huge because if I follow Helen and I reshare something that she tweets, I am doing two things. Number one, I'm expanding the reach of what Helen is saying. But number two, I'm saying, yeah, I really trust Helen. I really trust what she has to say. And I'm willing to advocate it and share it to my network. And that demonstrates true influence as a digital opinion leader. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> no, uh, no, no. Uh, and so, so what I would add is let's think about, let's think about, uh, and I guess I'm I'm curious to understand that the background to your question. So if we are, the fact that we understand about, if, if we're an aspiring MSL, the fact that we understand the difference between, for example, a key opinion leader and a digital opinion leader really demonstrates that we are current that we are really seeking to understand the external environment. If we are working in industry and we are, for example, um, we're, we're new to an organization or we're new to a company and we're thinking about building our, our network of external experts to really start what we have to do, what we want to do is we want to engage with the individual. We call this stakeholder centricity. So what do I know? What do I know and understand about this individual in terms of their, the way in which they will engage? And so a lot of this is, so think about the, the context of the question, but I, I think it was, um, and maybe Aoife knows the answer to this, I'm fairly sure that McKinsey have written a paper on the digital opinion leader and, and, and the sort of almost the classification, five stages of, of kind of where, where, where people sit in this. So there's a ton of stuff out there that you can read about. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a really important um, sort of point of, of learning at, at this time. So would you guys like recommend if, if like in, in MSL interviews or maybe like resumes or something to like have social media engagement as like a marketable skill like do you think that's that's an involving and upcoming marketable skill that that's like important to note down or important enough to note down on a resume when you're applying for MSL um, roles so, so 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 what i would so so i think i think there are two things here i i, I think what Aoife and maria k are, are talking about is when we're starting out we want to be networking we want to be really active on linkedin the whole social media piece in terms of pharma is, is a very different ball game because there are usually quite strict rules around what you can do as an MSL and, and what your organization is, is willing to do. So I, I, I think that 
to demonstrate your understanding. So, so what I'm imagining, so let's imagine you're interviewing for a role, okay, with a company, and let's imagine that you're interviewing for a role, I, I don't know, um, I'm just going to pull something out of the air, nephrology. Okay, so this company has an asset in nephrology and you're interviewing for a role and you are working, I'm, I'm guessing, in the USA. For you to go to that interview, being able to communicate, I've done my research and I've identified what I believe to be 10, 10 key external or key opinion leaders within the US who publish in the field of nephrology. And what I can tell you of the 10 is that, is that four of those are really active digital opinion leaders. That to me immediately tells me that you've, you've done your homework, but more importantly is, is that you're thinking around what are current trends. So I don't know what Marieke and, and Aoife would say to that, but just be careful in terms of, 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 of how you're using it for your CV. I, I, yeah. I completely agree with, with Helen. You have to have it you, you have to have this skill without the social media, you know, interactive skill, it's, you know, it's going to be very hard, your job as an MSL, but you cannot, there are many rules and regulations in, in place, and especially companies may be very specific about how you interact on, on social media. So you have to be very careful with how you, you know, engage in that particular way. Yeah, 100%. And to follow up on Helen's point as well, and I think it was a brilliant one, if you're able to go into an interview and say, you know, I know there's seven scientific leaders in this space and three of those are digitally active, go a step further and name them. Where do they work? What have they published on? For an MSL hiring manager, they want to try and hire someone who can hit the ground running. And if you've already identified at the interview stage that you know some of the top players in the space, it just makes means that when you do get hired, you'll be able to execute and add value as quickly as possible. And also from a digital opinion leader point of view, it's important to know who they are. It's important to know what they're saying. But as Helen and Marika said, be very careful in terms of interacting with them. So when I worked as an MSL, I specifically set up a Twitter account where I would follow digital opinion leaders. I would never comment. I would never like I would never repost things, but if I met them, I would say, oh, Professor X, I saw you recently tweeted about this and I would use it to tailor the conversation, but I wouldn't actually engage with them on a public forum because you represent the pharmaceutical company and it is a very, very compliant industry and we need to be wary of that. And, and I see something in the chats, a question like during digital engagement, how do we ensure that we are not using or saying anything promotional? And that's exactly why most companies have policies in place that as a, as a you know, employee, you're not allowed to uh, engage Comment. with, uh, uh, um, you know, on social media. Okay, yeah, some great insights and information yeah. there and I, identifying the digital opinion leaders and some of the differences with key opinion leaders. And then just for aspiring or current MSLs, uh, this is relevant to both. So just some advice maybe about uh, building and maintaining relationships with KOLs and achieving strategic objectives. Um, and maybe if we start with Aoife this time. Yeah, so in order to build a relationship and if we start at the very start if you need to reach out cold to someone make sure it is a tailored email don't copy and paste the same generic email these people are so busy you need to demonstrate you've done your research when you're building a relationship the one thing I always coach MSLs I train on never ask a question that could have been answered by Google do extensive pre-call planning and utilize that to demonstrate you've done your research, demonstrate you have respect their time and demonstrate your scientific credibility. So to give you a specific example, Gavin, I could go to you if you're a KOL and say, oh, Gavin, are you presenting at this Congress? Low value question. Or I could say, Gavin, I see you're presenting on this topic at this Congress. I'd love to understand from your experience how you think this topic will affect the treatment paradigm in this area. High value question, better insights. If you want to add value as an MSL, 
all your interactions need to be tailored and you need to do a massive amount of pre-call planning and be very strategic when you are engaging with these KOLs. If I'm engaging with Gavin as a KOL, I want to understand long-term what is the strategic objective of that relationship and then break it down. For my first meeting with Gavin, what is my objective? What questions am I going to ask and what data am I going to present in order to reach that objective and ensure it is aligned with the overall strategic objectives of the medical and brand plan? Yes, and, and, and I want to add that because the journey, the KOL journey is very important. And, and I think a lot of MSLs, you know, are overlooking it, don't have a good plan or strategic plan with, you know, where are they going with, with this particular relationship? But you have to go a step further because when you just plan the KOL journey and where you want to go, it is a one-way street. It's a one-way street from the KOL to uh, uh, the company or, or, or the MSL. And this is where your emotional intelligence uh, come, comes in um, because colors, disc, uh, whatever, how does your KOL want to receive? You know, many times uh, um, visits by MSLs are just considered data dumps and, and KOLs aren't really interested in continuing in, in that journey. So do you really understand what your KOL needs and are you aware how to bring that, you know, further? So I'm going to I, I'm going to take us even back a step. So I completely endorse everything that has been said previously. But the reason that individuals are called key opinion leaders is because they're respected in their space. And the, the vast majority of, of KOLs, the MSLs, wish to build relationships with are also being uh, spoken to by other individuals from within your company, never mind the competitive space that you work in. So actually, in order for us to engage and to build a strategic relationship, we first have to gain access. And this comes back to Eva's point about thinking about the relationship or thinking about, sorry, thinking about the communication that you, you make. So what's in it for me as a KOL to engage with Eva? What is EFA going to bring me that I can't access through my phone? Data information is there. It's available there at the press of a button. So really, um, you know, we, we talk about a thing called the trust equation. And the trust equation, it's, it's worth, go, 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 you know, go and check it out. But really the trust equation talks about credibility, reliability, security, divided by self-interest. So we will not build trust with our KOLs if we only engage on our agenda. In order for us to build trust and to, 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 to gain time with our KOLs, we have to offer them something that they don't otherwise have. And that can be challenging. So really ask yourself, what, what is the value that I am bringing to this individual? And, and it, again, everything starts with the why. Why would they want to engage with me? And if we can't answer that, then you need to go back to the planning piece that Aoife spoke about. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and that even uh, lines up, links up very nicely with ne the next question. So you mentioned about like why or how to add value. So, um, and asking that question to yourself. So do you have advice um, for how to add value um, as an MSL in the field with KOLs? And Let's go with, yeah, you can start telling since you're touching on it. So, 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 how to, so, so I think it comes back to, um, you know, well, let's start by identifying what, what our purpose is and what it is that we believe we have to offer. But then how does that intersect with what it is that our KOLs need? So I see we have a question here in chat, uh, as in what's in it for the KOLs. And, and so, so if you have got as far as gaining an opportunity to engage with your KOL, it means that they're interested. You, you, that there's something in what you're saying has, has made them want to engage with you. But the first thing you need to do is to say, you know, what we share is an interest in, in doing the best for patients with, you know, in nephrology. Let, let's think about that for, with renal cell carcinoma. 
Um, but actually, and, and this is who I am, and this is my background, and this is this is my experience. But actually, I'd like to understand more about you and how it is that I can add value to you. So that's come back. That comes back to the trust equation and back to self-interest. Let me help. Let me identify how I can best help you. I would add to that as well. Um, for those of you who haven't worked in the industry, um, for transparency reporting, you can see if a KOL has worked with your company or previous companies before, and also the type of work they've done. So if you're meeting up with a KOL and you know that they have been involved, in um, clinical trials, for example, sponsored by a pharma company, if you know they have done consultancy agreements, if you know that they have spoken on behalf of pharma companies, it gives you a little bit of insight into the <laughs> types of activities that they may be interested in partnering go with you on. And bucks. then going back to um, Helen's point, really ask them, you know, how can you add value? What is interesting to them. I know I've worked with KOLs before um, and they really wanted to present to GPs because they got a lot of referrals from local GPs. So that was something that as a company we were able to facilitate. We did educational meeting for local general practitioners and this benefited and added value to that particular KOL because they were able to then get referrals and educate local GPs in their area. Yeah, as, as we're talking, I'm I'm thinking about, and I, I can't remember where it was or where I saw that, but there's a list of questions that MSLs should know about their, their KOL. So with all the background information, and it goes back to the um, McKay 66. McKay was a, um, a um, you know, he bought an envelope company and of course there was a lot of, you know, uh, uh, competition going, going on and now he's one of the only envelope companies that's going on. But he had developed a, a checklist of, of 66 questions that he wants, wanted all his sales representatives to know about their customers. And what he meant with that, it was both, you know, professional and also some of the things on personal level is that when you know your customer or KOL so incredibly well, that is the moment you can, can serve them. So that's essentially what both of you said, and uh, you will have to look somewhere, uh, Google it somewhere, but there is an MSL uh, a questionnaire like that as well that has, you know, what clinical trials have they participated in? How often do they enroll? What is the, um, you know, do they have a... Um, IRB or is it local or central or or things like that? There somewhere on the internet, something like that is circling around. I would Google that. Okay, and then yeah, even in line with that, just for building uh, the relationships and maintaining them and adding value. And I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, uh, Marieke, uh, just about emotional intelligence. So I was just wondering if you could maybe expand. I know it's kind of your your area of expertise, so just the importance of emotional intelligence um, for MSL. Yeah. That's a, um, so, so we did a study about two years ago where we asked uh, several KOLs and major academic institutions in the Northeast about, you know, how did they think about their uh, MSLs? And so the difference was really with, you know, a, an MSL with poor emotional intelligence, an MSL with average emotional intelligence, and an MSL with excellent uh, emotional intelligence. And the the point was that those MSLs who had really cultivated their emotional intelligence had a substantially greater impact on, on their KOLs. They had a greater impact on, you know, uh, um, data sharing, relationship building, and were also more considered a part of, you know, the treatments, you know, team, so to speak, were easier to, to reach out. And with emotional intelligence, there's a lot of, you know, uh, um, you know, what is it exactly? Some people will go with, uh, you know, an emotional quotient and measure it very uh, um, scientifically. And that's actually a very, you know, dangerous or artificial uh, um, test. And, and so there's a lot of debate about it because actually people who are, you know, very much on the psychopath level who have a very good 
understanding of what another person wants and needs, but uses that for themselves can score incredibly high on an EQ test. So we try to stay away from uh, an EQ test, but we talk about emotional in intelligence, EI, where the measure of your impact determines your level of emotional intelligence, not how well you perceive it. And so then you come within the different aspects of self-awareness, because if you don't cannot name label it within yourself, you can never name or label it within another. So awareness of others, you know, what does the other need? This is how I communicate and what I need out of my communications, but this is how the other communicates and need to get you know, their, their needs met and, and, and learns uh, things. And how do you show up authentically? And that really means, you know, do you come across as genuine or are you more there with an agenda? I'm here to data dump because this is my job or I'm here because I care on, about your patients and I am part of your team to make the best decisions for uh, your, your patients. Um, the, the third, fourth pillar is emotional reasoning. So we all make all our decisions based on our emotions. Even when we deny that we make uh, our, our decisions on emotions, we are still doing that. Uh, so are you using your emotions and the emotions that are in the particular situation in a productive or an unproductive uh, manner? Uh, then the next part is self-management with are you having the right emotion to the right extent with the right person in the right situation if you are frustrated in a conversation with your KOL that's information you know why are you frustrated that's the self-awareness and then how can you bring that in into the conversation to a better uh, um, solution and that is how emotional intelligence eventually encourages a good positive uh, in influence. So that was me in my soapbox. Obviously, I like this part. <laughs> but he, here's here's the thing. The better you are skilled at that, but the more you go beyond self-awareness and awareness of others, the deeper your relationships, the more genuine and the more, you know, stronger they are in 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 the long term. Now that that's some fantastic information, Mary, because of course MSL have to have like the scientific knowledge, but also a big part of that relationship building and maintaining the relationship and and that actual like the kind of the human connection and having the emotional intelligence to do so. So I know we're just right up on the hour and want to be respectful of everyone's time. So maybe I'm just going to ask uh, each one of the panelists for maybe two to three points. Uh, just maybe to briefly summarize maybe how to just about how to excel as an MSL, maybe some two, three key takeaways from each one of you. And we start with alphabetical audience or Aoife first this time. Yeah, um, two to three points on how to excel as an MSL. Understand the strategic objectives and what you're trying to achieve. Tailor your interactions and really focus on adding value to the KOLs. And don't forget to share those wonderful insights internally as well. Really grow your personal brand within a network internally as well as externally as an MSL. And Helen, next then. Uh, so, so what I would say is, uh, so I'm, I'm going to um, get everyone to think about the capabilities that are required to be successful today and we haven't we haven't really talked about those in in great detail but ask yourself where are my strengths where are my areas for development ask for feedback and really maintain a growth mindset none of us are ever the finished article so um think think about how you can grow um and and within your role to grow in confidence because uh, whether it's your EQ, your EI, as, as Maria Kay is saying, or your, or your IQ or your SQ, which is your strategic quotient, we talk about your SQ, um, it's that triangle of success that will really allow you to excel. Yeah, um, it's hard to follow these two, obviously, every, every single time. Um, but yes, um, having a growth mindset, you know, be curious. 
the moment you are curious about something, whether it's about, you know, what's going on, uh, are you growing with your, you know, what are your gaps, uh, you know, what's going on with your, your KOL, the moment you are curious, you are engaging your growth mindset, you're engaging your cortex, and you are working with your emotional intelligence. So even if you think, I don't know about emotional intelligence, be curious. That's the first, first thing. Okay, excellent. Yeah, some great advice and summary points there. I know this is this is very challenging, and with with the wealth of knowledge and information and experience of all the panelists, that we could have kept talking for probably hours and days on even just one of these topics. Never mind trying to address numerous <laughs> ones. So I'm sure that the audience found some great benefit and uh, information, and from our discussion today. And I just want to thank all three of you for your time today um, and taking it out and giving back to and helping others as well and for all the work that you do in your professional work and um, also kind of mentoring and consulting and helping aspiring and current MSL so it's really great to see so anyone who is an aspiring MSL or current MSL then I'm sure uh, Aoife, uh, Helen and uh, Marieke are more than happy for you to reach out to them on LinkedIn and maybe go to their web pages, websites. I know they've all got some great resources, podcasts, uh, some newsletters and stuff that are all great resources and sources of information um, for people aspiring MSLs and current MSLs and in medical affairs. Um, and then, yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone as well for joining us today for our third birthday. Uh, it's been, been great to celebrate with you all and have an absolute stellar lineup of panelists that we've had today and a thoroughly enjoyable discussion. And then this will be mine and Sonia's last time uh, co-hosting it before we hand it over to Jen and Melody, who introduced themselves today. So uh, I would just like to say thank you as well to um, everyone for the experience over the past years. And then, of course, to Lindsay uh, and Renee, who are the ones who co-founded uh, this webinar a few years ago just for everyone who's interested in how the community has been growing and um, just helping each other out so it's always great to see and then of course go follow the Ask and Tell and M MSL page on LinkedIn and share this with anyone that maybe you know of or in your network that might find resources like this helpful and we'll also have the recording um, and other information up on YouTube as well for people to see and um, so I think that's everything that I have for today. Um, unless anyone else, Jen or Melody or Sonia, do you have anything final parting words to say? No, nothing else. Just thank you for attending all. And we had a wonderful time um, having these wonderful speakers today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the following months. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you yeah. all very much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and keep an eye out on the uh, LinkedIn page where we'll be posting about future events that we'll be having uh, usually monthly. So keep an eye out there and we look forward to seeing you at some future events and webinars. Uh, thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Thank everyone. you for hosting. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. Bye. Thanks, bye, everyone. Bye, Mary Kay. Bye bye, you everyone. Soon. And I'll have to connect bye -bye. with you, Effie. That's, uh, yes, uh, I, I need to reach out to you, okay? Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Bye. bye, take care. Bye.